Hey there, this is Pete Townsend from Norio Ventures, and welcome to Money Never Sleeps, a podcast that looks inside the head of entrepreneurs and at the crossover of startups, enterprise, finance, technology, and life as we know it. This episode of Money Never Sleeps is sponsored by PAT Fintech, the training partner that demystifies fintech and digital finance for financial services professionals. We've got Mick Sweeney on the show this week, who is the CEO at Pinebridge Investments in Ireland, a private global asset manager focused on active, high-conviction investing. Mick and I were introduced back in 2018 through a mutual friend. We got on famously right away through a shared appreciation for the merits of strategic change, restructuring, and execution, but also just because Mick's a really good guy with an innate curiosity for how things work and how people think. With that, let's get inside Mick's mind a bit with this week's episode of Money Never Sleeps. Money Never Sleeps, pal. Here we go again, recording from the home studio with Mick Sweeney, CEO at Pinebridge Investments in Ireland. Before joining Pinebridge in 2019, Mick had a long career with Bank of Ireland in global markets, asset management, wealth management, and insurance, and also took an active interest in some entrepreneurial, educational, social, and charitable endeavors. With that, welcome to the show, Mick. Thank you, Pete, and happy Thanksgiving to you and to all of your listeners. I'm delighted to be on the show. Awesome. Thanks so much, Mick. And yes, we are recording this fine Thanksgiving morning. Turkey is going in the oven in about six hours time. Um, (laughs) As as most, you know, listeners would know out there, I'm still hobbling around on crutches. So we did uh, order the turkey from Avoca and that will be a naturally cooked turkey, but it is uh, just a turkey crown and all the fixings that go along with that are all wonderfully pre-cooked by the wonderful folks at Avoca. So we're good to go. I can smell it from here. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Listen, Mick, thanks so much for coming on to the show. This is long overdue. So Mick, listen, let's just jump right into it. Can you just share with our listeners your backstory, how you got started in the financial markets and how you got to this point? Absolutely, Pete. Um, And I I give you the positive history rather than the long version. We'd be here for days. I joined Bank of Ireland from school um, and then went to college by night and got into the bank's treasury early on in my career and there just got exposure to balancing the bank's books. In other words, all the cash that came into the bank on a daily basis versus all the, all the cash that went out of the bank. And my job was to balance that, go into the markets, find cash if we were short and defray the surpluses if we had long balances on a daily basis. And that really gave me an interest in markets. From there, I graduated on to trading Irish gilts. That's Irish sovereign paper where the, you know, the government issued gilts to finance the, the deficits, the public deficits and the budgets. Yep. From there, went to trade international bonds, got lucky with that, then managed a bunch of people who were traders. And then I suppose I got my first big break, went to the UK in the early 90s to turn around the business that the bank had there. Spent a very a couple of very interesting years turning around that business. Came back to Ireland, ran the global trading for Bank of Ireland. We had a big global business at that stage. Yep. Um, and then in 2006, took a complete turn in my career, went from the whole capital markets division went straight into the asset management division, which was like a different a different continent, Completely. never mind a different country. Worked at that and sold that business in 2010 to State Street. From there, went into wealth management and finished up my career in Bank of Ireland in 2017 as the interim chief executive of New Ireland Assurance, uh, which was great. So I had a fantastic uh, career in, in, a, in a great company, Bank of Ireland, and then came across to Pinebridge in 2019. And here I am today. Awesome. That's really cool. Like, you know, that, that first part that you shared, Mick, about the first experience of you working in Treasury and having to place that cash, the excess cash, or at the end of the day, or you know, as part of your process throughout the day, thinking about the most optimal placement of that cash, that must have given you at a early age, quite some great exposure there to how the markets work. Yeah. Absolutely, Pete. 
for the simple reason that all markets are interconnected. So if anything happened uh, globally, it clearly impacted on the markets domestically. And as a result, uh, interest rates would either go up or go down. And if you're looking for money and interest rates are going up, <laughs> you're going to pay higher rates for it, which is not a good thing. And if rates are going down and you're getting rid of surpluses, you're getting less interest uh, for that money. So you clearly had to have an insight and a view on where markets were going to be able to play the markets. But it gave you fantastic exposure, gave you fantastic interest. No two days were alike. And that's where I suppose the passion for this business was born. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. And right about that time, I was learning a lot in, in school about the difference between qualitative analysis and quantitative analysis of the markets. And I think, you know, looking at it from today's perspective, with a load of information coming at everybody now, we, on both of those sides of the, the analysis, you know, thinking about how you did that when that information wasn't as free flowing is just kind of mind blowing. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Sometimes it was pure gut instinct. You had to make a call. You, you never possessed full information. So you had to make a judgment call, take possession of the information that you had at hand and then make a call whether you dealt or didn't deal at that particular time. You got some right. Obviously, I got more right than I got wrong. But when you got wrong, you, you had to be able to bounce back and have the resilience to put it behind you, move on the next day, get back into the markets, trade them again. So really, you're either built for that or you're not. I found I was built for it, which was lucky. I was lucky, uh, which was fantastic. Great time. Really, really appreciate that. that I, I get that. That makes a lot of sense. Fast forwarding to 2018, when you and I first connected through Serena de Stackpool. Shout out to Serena. Just a wonderful person, uh, full of energy and enthusiasm. You were in the part of your career that I referred to in the intro, Mick, as engaging in some entrepreneurial, educational, social, and charitable endeavors. Given that point where you and I met, and we had our first chat in Ballsbridge somewhere, I think it was. Uh, what was the trigger point for you to take up that leadership role at Pinebridge? Yes. Uh, and then, uh, firstly, Serena, fanta fantastic lady. And she was on, on my team in New Ireland Assurance and did a fantastic job in there. So, yes, I was building after leaving the bank, I was building a very interesting portfolio where I was getting involved in stuff that I was genuine, that genuinely interested me and inspired me. So I was lucky to be invited uh, to be a guest lecturer to the MBA class in Trinity. And if you recall, you came in and helped me where yep. you spoke to the MBA class on blockchain and distributed ledgers. And we all learned something from you that day. So I, I took on a portfolio. I was invited on to the board of the Great Children's Charity Make-A-Wish and then I got involved in a couple of very exciting startups. There's a mortgage uh, online startup called Doddle, um, being run by another great lady, Martina Hennessy. Mm -hmm. um, I got involved in scale-ups and uh, went back to school, went to the Institute of Directors and got my diploma in company direction. And so I was very happy looking at all of that. And then serendipity played a part in what happened next. So the people that I had sold the asset management business to 10 years earlier in State Street had since that time left State Street and were now running Pinebridge. And they came to me and asked me, would I have an interest in running their Irish operation and helping them to build um, a business in Ireland? And that was really it. So uh, it was an offer I, I couldn't refuse. I just loved it going back into the markets. Great team here. They'd been here in Ireland for 30 years. Um, so I was joining a great team and then a great global business as well. They're a, they're a huge global active manager with over 100 billion of assets under management and great heritage and a, a rich um, history of delivering alpha. So yeah, so loving it. Awesome. Awesome. That's great to hear that, you know, the, when you sold that business, obviously as part of, as part of Bank of Ireland to State Street and then keeping 
those connections, obviously, you never know, right? Um, it, it, the world is a small place and, and things do come back to you in the long run. So that's great to hear. I was, I was part of a, an M&A deal back five, six years ago that wasn't as, uh, what's the word, amicable in terms of that. But thankfully, one of the folks on the other side of the table, I'm now pals with in podcast land. So, you know, it's, uh, th- th- there's always room to, uh, to improve these things, right? There you go. Network. It's all about networking and keeping those networks alive and nurturing them. You have no idea when an opportunity will just come around the corner from that network. Absolutely. Absolutely. Taking a look at your LinkedIn profile, Mick, as I always do, obviously we know each other quite well at this stage, but I think the LinkedIn profile kind of gives away a few hints and tips about people and, and to, to get inside their head a little bit, which is the point of, of this podcast. So one of the lines that stands out to me is probably the most meaningful to how I think that we've gotten to know each other in the last couple of years. And that line is strategic change, restructuring, and execution, right? One of the more recent discussions that we had before the pandemic struck was on Ireland's role in the global financial markets, how there's a big opportunity in front of us with Brexit, in particular with asset management. What elements of strategic change would you encourage your fellow financial leaders to pursue in Ireland to take advantage of this opportunity that's in front of us? Yeah, well, Pete, as you you well know, um, with Brexit, there has been many regulatory and passporting challenges around funds, um, especially into Europe with the UK exiting. And we all know Ireland has been a huge beneficiary in the funds world with the UK's exit. Um, I think we had more licensed applications for mancos, super mancos, and, and, and the latest buzzword is mega mancos yeah. than any other European country. So from a funds perspective, you know, fund structures, fund frameworks and oversight, there's, there's been a fantastic influx of business into what I would call the middle offices. And that has been hugely beneficial to the country. Uh, we have, I think, three trillion of assets under advisement now domiciled in Ireland, uh, employing about 16,000 people. And somebody told me recently, there's over a thousand international managers with funds registered or domiciled in Ireland. So that's a fantastic framework and a fantastic, I suppose, um, platform to build from. And where I would be recommending my fellow industry leaders strategically to be looking is to see what we can build on top of that platform. In other words, what's the opportunity to bring front end, high end investment roles to Ireland? And I think over the next three to five years, we should be looking to see how do we build what I would call defensible niche products, defensible niche funds, that will be insulated from attack from the global players. And how do we build those in Ireland? What what specifically am I talking about? Well, to start with, if you take where Ireland in other industries has been very successful, where they have built ecosystems, where they've built networks around pharma, around biotech, around aircraft leasing, uh, around medical devices, we're world renowned and leaders in these areas in those industries. So my question for the funds industry is at the front end, in the dealing rooms, why can we not be the capital of Europe or the capital of the world for med tech funds, for insure tech funds, for fintech funds, for aircraft leasing funds? Why not look at blockchain, crypto, uh, tokenized funds, for example? green funds, sustainable funds, and get the people and the traders and the investors to come to Ireland and build these funds and be renowned for being the front office on top of being the middle office for some of these niche products. And I think that's a phenomenal opportunity. But what you need to do, of course, is get the people, you need to attract the talent, you need to build a pipeline of talent. So you do need to to partner with the universities and build a pipeline of young kids and young graduates who aren't going to be traveling the world probably as broadly as heretofore, 
because of what's happened with the pandemic, mm-hmm. but creating the opportunities for them in these real specialized, high end, exciting opportunities. Also, I think we'll be able to attract home talent that may be working in Asia or uh, in the US. I think a lot of that talent will be happy to come home and get involved in a new, exciting venture. And there's so many opportunities there. I think it's a fantastic time. I, I think you're right. I think you're right. And it is about bringing the talent back. I was working on a Brexit committee a couple of years ago or four years ago nearly now with Irish funds. And we looked at the prospect of what will happen with Brexit and what are some of the opportunities like you're talking about and just seeing all it takes is a few, right? To, to want to move home because Ireland's probably one of the best exporters of talent in the world, right? To other countries. And it's been going on for hundreds of years. Um, and it's the reason why I'm still alive, right? Because my family left 170 years ago. Thinking about how the startup community has evolved over the years here in Ireland with people that had launched businesses, brought those businesses to the US or the UK or Europe or further afield, and some of them have come home, right? They've sold their businesses and they're looking to start again, right? I think we could take that same approach here on the front office side in the fund management industry and create that competency, like you're saying, but it just takes a few folks to to want to start doing that and set the example and provide that leadership here. I think that would be fantastic if, but like you said, it's not an overnight thing. I think it is a um, a medium to long term adaptation to the realities of the world right now um, that I think Ireland has the opportunity to grab. Yeah, absolutely, Pete. Um, if we don't do it, we'll have we'll have missed a really genuine opportunity here to create a new ecosystem around front office funds. Um, and if we don't do it, either Paris or Frankfurt will do it. And we, you know, but. So we have to be proactive. We have to go after this with purpose. It's not going to happen by osmosis. But I do think now when I look at the various companies who have come into Ireland because of Brexit and who have had to build up platforms and create substance, all of the right ingredients in terms of leadership and in terms of firepower are here in Ireland. So it's just a matter of getting on and doing it, as you say. Yep. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. And and thinking about this from a from a societal perspective, like I just mentioned, thinking back over your career in the financial markets, how do you think your approach to managing financial businesses has been influenced by global societal changes over the course of the last, you know, 15, 20 years? Yeah, I'd say probably three societal changes, two of which I look back on and one which is happening at the moment, maybe starting with the first one, diversity and inclusion. As you should probably be aware, um, asset rooms and dealing rooms were very much the prevail of male, pale, and stale. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And it was very male-dominated, you know, as, as people would know from the various, you know, the Wolf of Wall Street and other such productions. Yeah. Um, So I suppose what I would have felt over the years and what I would have seen and what I would have been an advocate of was that um, the more women that came into the dealing room and into those high octane jobs, the better decision making as a group and the better profitability we got. And I witnessed that probably 20 years ago first and have been a huge advocate of ensuring that we brought in more talent, more uh, female talent uh, from college, uh, but also at at various levels into the asset management business, into the capital markets business, even uh, at the moment in in my own role in Pinebridge, 50% of my leadership team are are women. Mm -hmm. Uh, My two independent non-executive directors uh, on the board of Pine Bridge in Ireland are both women. And what I find is that we we just make better decisions. There's less of the group think, which, you know, was part and parcel of what happened in the global financial crisis back in 2010. There's less of the testosterone 
um, that floats around dealing rooms where everybody feels they have to have to take positions. Some of the best money is made by deals that are not done. And yeah. the way women are wired and their thinking processes lead to better decision making in, in that regard. So I'm a huge proponent of the diversity and inclusion across boards, in capital markets businesses, in investment businesses, in all businesses, in fact. So that's been, I suppose, the first societal change probably would have indulged in it uh, in the early 90s when it wasn't too fashionable, but it has served me well. And I would say um, having that diversity and inclusion has been a huge boon to my success or a huge uh, propeller of my success over the years. Yeah, and just to just comment on that quickly before we, you know, before you get to the next two, I'm thinking that uh, I, one of the founders I'm working with right now, I'm just kind of thinking about how he does his thing, right? And how he uses his team and leverages his team to gather information in order to make a decision. And I'm reading Ray Dalio's principles right now and kind of uh, not far enough into the book yet where mm-hmm. I've figured out what how he does it, but I'm kind of sensing that and it, well, I am at the part of the book where he's talking about gathering information to make decisions and having that diversity of thought, having that diversity of background and walks of life, whatever, you're just going to get some richer information and some broader perspectives to help you make better decisions. It's just business sensible, right? To have a more diverse team. And, you know, I'm like I said, I'm seeing that with a founder that I'm working with and, you know, he's brought on a few additional folks recently from a different walk of life. And I'm starting to sense and feel this be a richer, like a, like you said, a richer decision-making process, which can be quite helpful, can it? Listen, Pete, our, some of our top performing portfolio managers in Pinebridge globally are women. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the best traders I have uh, encountered over the last 30 years have been women. You know, the results are there. This is this this is uncontestable at this stage. Decision making is better with diversity, and it's not just gender diversity. Obviously, it's diversity of thought, it's diversity of background, it's diversity of of uh, geography, etc. But obviously, gender uh, diversity is a, a big proponent of, of of the whole of that decision making. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'll, I'll tell you this, Mick, I'm, I'm a heck of a lot more comfortable with what's going on or what will be going on in the White House come January uh, with a more diverse approach going on there. So let, let's talk about the next two that you had in mind as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and just before I go off the, the gender piece, I think there's a lot still needs to be done. Absolutely. Um, across different industries, including our own industry. Um, and there's a lot needs to be done around the pay gap. The gender pay gap, and that is that that is something that I feel passionate about as well. But let's move on. Yep. The second societal chain stroke trend, I suppose, has been the the move from digitization to digital transformation to digitalization. Yeah. Um, certainly, when I would have worked in Bank of Ireland, I would have been involved in a lot of the first of those which was digitization, which was the move from analog to digital. The digital transformation we were trying to make at the time in the bank, that's where obviously where you bring the people and the hearts and minds. Um, We never really had got to the digitalization, which is clearly where you're moving a culture, where you're using the the, uh, technology, where you're ensuring that there's enablement from an employee perspective, but also where you have true customer centricity. So I think financial services, Pete, has been behind the eight ball and the banks have been behind the eight ball. And and I was part of that. So I hold a mirror up to myself. It's only now when you see what the neo banks are doing, what the Monzas, the Revoluts, the M26s, the Starlings, all of these, what they're doing, how they're going about their business, how they're attracting customers that you can see you know how digitalization is really changing the the fabric and how and behaviors for financial services 
And this is going to continue at, at a more rapid pace, I believe. And um, our industry is no different. The asset management, there are some very good digital players out there like Betterment in the States. You probably know them yourself. Yep. Uh, Nutmeg in the UK. Uh, and they're putting customer and the retail customer first. I think the real threat to the financial services world is if Facebook or Google wake up one morning and figure they want to be a bank yeah. or an investment manager because they clearly have much more information on all of us than banks do or insurers or investment managers. So um, I think the pace for retail customers, for wealth platforms, for institutional customers of this digitalization is just going to, to, to carry on. And we've seen that obviously over the last six months with the pandemic, the impact of the uh, pandemic. So I think that's a, a second societal change. Um, yeah, I really, I really like that one and thrilled to hear that you that you did get it right because a lot of folks, when they're talking about digital, they talk about digitization and digitalization as if they're the same word, right? But you, you, you got it right. You inserted the very important part of it of digital transformation, which can be referred to in different ways as well, which is the people, the hearts and minds, right? So changing that first. And I think DBS in Singapore, I talk about them frequently. They're the ones who started a very long digital transformation project. And I'd say, I think it was the first few years, it was all about changing the people. Right. And not replacing the people. It was about upskilling people and getting them to think differently about their businesses, which um, which is that. And and just on your point on on Monzo and Starling and N26, I know one of the founders of Monzo and N20 and Monzo and Starling, who was one of the co-founders. And his whole framework just goes right back to, like you said, what's called jobs to be done. What is the end customer? What do they want? right? What is the job that, that you need to do for them? And you can break that down into 10, 15, 20 different sub jobs and digitalize all of that, right? And where you give them a completely digital experience. And that is obviously the whole context of digitalization. So, you know, it sounds like you, you've got a real eye for this as well, Mick, which I'm not surprised about given your, uh, your history in the industry and, and your embracing of change. Well, I haven't... <laughs> I haven't always got it right, Pete, but I suppose um, I've learned along the way, you know, that that you need to have the customer in the conversation at all times. And we need to be solving a problem for the customer, not a problem that we think the customer has. We need, you know, it is customer first, it's digital first. But so there's a journey to, to be traveled here. But yep. um, I think, again, a phenomenal opportunity for those businesses that get it right and understand the customer um, demand early. Absolutely, absolutely. This episode of Money Never Sleeps is sponsored by PAT FinTech, demystifying FinTech and digital finance for financial services professionals. PAT FinTech enable financial services professionals to transform their capabilities into the digital age. With dedicated virtual training programs, geared towards those that can develop, deliver, and monitor optimally customized user experiences balanced by appropriate governance, control, and oversight. To learn more about PAT FinTech, go to moneyneversleeps.ie slash PAT FinTech. What's the, what's the third one that you- The third one, the third one is the one we're witnessing at the moment. Um, and uh, it's the gig economy. It's the blended workforce and it's the blended workplace. And we're all getting clearly, we've all been catapulted into this over the last six to nine months. The one certainty is that we're not going home. Yeah. In other words, we're not going back to the way we, we were. All the research and all the surveys now say that people want blended, blended workplace around 50% working from home, 50% working from an office space. So that is huge ramifications for businesses, for planning, for learning, for brainstorming, for collaborating, for decision-making, for team building, the whole office footprint, commuting to work, uh, workflow management. 
So I think from a leadership perspective, you know, people will need to be much more flexible, adaptable, creative, innovative, resilient, empathetic, um, and genuinely what I would call employee-centric. Yeah. Um, what I mean by employee-centricity is engagement, encouragement, and trust will be huge prerequisites. I think the era of management by presenteeism is dead. Mm. And there was a lot of leadership that, you know, followed that principle. You needed to see your people. You needed to stand in front of your people on a daily basis and show them the way and the light. I think that's that's very much passe. It's a a much different environment. And and again, um, a much more exciting and interesting environment for the future to have this blended workforce and blended workplace. Yeah, that's a really strong point. And just thinking about one of the companies that I work with, uh, Coinbase, and they've been quite public about this and that we're looking at this whole idea for the longer term now, they are work remotely first, right? Or a remote first company. And what they've acknowledged is that there is a transformation, for lack of a better word, that you need to do to your whole kind of advancement opportunities for staff in that you can't really, if you give people the choice to either work from home or to uh, work in an office, that those that work in the office can't be advantaged over those that are working from home or working remotely because they have more face time with those in the more senior positions, right? Now, that's not to say that those in the senior positions might not be working remotely as well, right? So, I mean, that's a really interesting concept in terms of how you, when you make that change, um, which like you said, there's probably no going back from, adapting your um, advancement, your opportunities, your promotion opportunities, those types of things to reflect the fact that, well, some people may be in front of senior management, others may not, right? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Pete. Absolutely right. Yep. It, it's an in, interesting change to the world. And we're right in the middle of all this, Mick, right? And it's like, you know, we could sit here with our crystal ball um, and <laughs> pretend to know with somewhat of an intelligent position how it's all going to work out. But you just got to take it day by day and hopefully have some type of strategic plan to, um, or it, definitely have a, a type of a strategic plan in order to, uh, you know, to carry things forward. And I, I, I think, Pete, you know, there used to be an adage the survivors will be the winners. I think that's moved on. I think now it is the early adopters are going to be the winners and the people that get this and understand that there is a change in leadership style needed are going to be the winners and and, and will get the gains from the market opportunities because they will be bringing their teams with them. Yeah. Yeah. I just got to chill down my spine thinking of something there, Mick, that you know, I've, I said frequently that in the midst of this pandemic, those that had already been somewhat digital on the way in, and we're talking about bigger businesses here, not the, you know, at the startup and scale up level, those are the ones that are going to be able to adapt the best. If you look at it from a leadership perspective, those that had already embraced a leadership style of connecting and communicating with people first, generally going to be the ones that will succeed in this new world order that we're now in, right? Yeah, absolutely. Very good. Bringing things forward, right, to the here and now and and where you're sitting today, Mick, and and thanks for sharing those perspectives on really what is the last 15, 20 years of societal change and where you think where where we are right now. But can you talk about some of the investment themes of Pinebridge that reflect your current views of the market, especially with the election now behind us? And this is my favorite subject, Pete. You've you've, you've, you've hit the jackpot here. Um, Good. And because we're a global active or high conviction manager, our investment experts will have strong views globally. So maybe just to put the context around them, they believe or we believe that the interplay of the three P's, the first P is the pandemic, the second P is politics, and the third P is policy, we think are going to have big implications for portfolio allocations beyond the next year. So what do we think is going to happen? Firstly, from an, from an economic perspective, we believe that we're at the start of a multi-year expansionary cycle, okay? Yep. And the exogenous shock of the pandemic and the lockdowns 
have thrown us into the start of this new cycle. Just to put that in, in, in comparison, the last classic early cycle was back in 2009. And we saw what happened after that. So what are the hallmarks of this multi-year expansion recycle? The first thing is, as you, you'd probably be aware, you know, we've had huge fiscal and monetary measures. And they have been very consistent across the globe this time. They've been huge and they've been concentrated and they've been early. Mm. The number that is the, the amount of support in the global economy as a result of fiscal and monetary support is now 24 trillion US dollars. Wow. That is 24,000 billion US dollars. Wow. And it equates to 28% of global GDP. Now, that is an absolutely huge number and completely dwarfs the support that was put in by the central banks to the global financial crisis back in 2009 and 2010. Yeah. And if you recall back then, of course, it was fiscal austerity, unlike this time where the governments are actually adding more uh, stimulus to the, to the world economy. So that's a, that's a big, big number, Mick. And I'm just thinking that's about 25% of the entire global asset management market. It, it is it, it it is off the Richter scale, Pete. So if you take that all of that money is being poured into the financial markets, it needs to find a home. So and and savings rates are going up globally as well, both tactically and structurally. So we're seeing that we're not going to have fiscal fiscal austerity this time. So the recovery we believe it is going to come through and it is going to be a multi-year recovery. So what do we like? Let's let's talk, let's talk brass tacks here. What we like, we like equities. Yep. We like US cyclical equities. We like US financials. We like European small caps. Mm -hmm. We like Chinese equities, mm -hmm. uh, emerging markets, emerging markets such as South Korea equities. We'd be um, a fan of fixed income and credit markets, emerging market corporates we like. We like Asian investment grade. We like emerging market sovereign, uh, high yield. And we're also a fan of gold as a hedge against inflation. And we like what we're, what we're calling a, a productivity basket. And a productivity basket basically are, are stocks that are going to be sought after in the new world, such mm -hmm. as cloud computing, cybersecurity, um, the Internet of Things, IT services, software as service, you know, workflow management software, automation and robotics. So we call all of those, we call them the productivity basket, and we'd be a big fan of those. So very constructive and um, very positive over a multi-year horizon on risk assets. So I hope that will give your listeners an insight into our thinking. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's that fourth P with the first one being, like you said, pandemic, politics, policy. The fourth one sounds like productivity. Yes, 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 indeed. And glad to hear that you share that that fourth P because I more or less just shifted the balance of my portfolio a few months ago towards the fourth P. So <laughs> good. Great minds think alike. But and I won't say and fools. <laughs> good, glad, glad to hear that. And um, I am still looking for the right type of investment vehicle to reflect that fourth P. So I will have a deeper look at what you guys are doing. So I think that's, uh, you know, th thank you for sharing that. That, that could be helpful in, in more ways than one, Mick. <laughs> oh. Good. We we'll talk offline. Absolutely. When you think about the future, what excites you the most? And with that, is there anything that you'd like to learn more about because of that? Oh, Pete, how long have we got? Um, and what excites me, there's so much out there from your AI to your robot technology to your blockchain distributed ledgers, all of that 
But the one probably that I need to get to know uh, a lot more about, and I'd love to get to look, to know a lot more about, is Globotics. Okay. And you've probably heard, or your listeners may have heard, Richard Baldwin has written this book, The Globotics Upheaval. And essentially, he is saying that there is a, a dislocation coming that will make the Industrial Revolution um, look like a teddy bear's picnic. Okay. And in, so what is he talking about? He's basically talking about the marriage of robotics and globalization and the future of work. And what he is in his, his argument is that there is a huge explosion in the pace of development in robotics and what he calls telemigration. And in essence, he thinks this is going to disrupt the white collar working force and the service sector. And if you think about it, Pete, 80 to 90% of people in the advanced economies today, the advanced economies today, work in the services sector. And his view is with telemigration that you will be able to get highly talented people from low cost countries to telemigrate with, ro with robotics their talent into the high cost areas and okay. disrupt the service industry. And he believes, and this is why I need to get more, I need to learn more about it myself. He believes that this is go just going to be a phenomenal disruption revolution on the services sector over the next number of decades. So that's the globotics. And then what I'm trying to get my kids to teach me uh, is the difference between AR, VR, and now what they're calling MR, mixed reality. So I'm a novice on, on that one, but um, I'll be getting up the curve quickly with my with my 11-year-old at the moment who thinks he knows it all, you know yeah. the way. <laughs> yeah, I, I've got, got an intro for you that could be helpful there. Uh, you may know him already, but Barry Downs at Shore Valley Ventures, that's his thing in a big way, is, uh, is AR and VR. So maybe maybe... You know, you could get your kids together with him, and then see see what happens, and and see what comes of <laughs> absolutely that conversation. Awesome, and we will put the the globotics upheaval, as you said, by Richard Baldwin. We'll put that into the show notes, and I think that's going to make it into my Kindle uh, after uh, after Ray Dalio and a few other things as well. Reading a great book right now, actually, Mick. It's called Boys in the Boat, um, and it's about the. I have it. Uh, oh, you do. I have it, but I haven't read it, but I have it. And it's on my it's on my Christmas list to read. Wonderful. My sister sent it to me as a, well, you know, the first couple of weeks after my foot surgery, I wasn't doing much. And um, she's like, well, here's a couple of books for you, Pete. And it was nice to get like a real book instead of, you know, just picking up the Kindle again. But it's uh, it, it becomes a page turner after the first 15, 20 pages or so. And you just want to keep reading it just to see what happens. So uh, but it's about just just for the listeners, it's about a group of rowers from Washington State round about the time of uh, the 1936 Olympics in in between, obviously, World War One and World War Two. And the 1936 Olympics were in Germany. Um, so if that gives anything away right there, definitely pick it up and give it a read. But like I said, Globotics upheaval will make it onto the list as well. Well, well, Pete, one one good book deserves another one in return. Uh, one that I'll recommend to you and to your listeners is a book that was written back in the 1930s by Napoleon Hill called Think and Grow Rich. Yes, you've told Fantastic. me about this one before. Absolutely. Just get into it. I'm on my third read. I think I, I, I'll probably end up reading it at least 10 times done master classes on it and um it is absolutely superb and obviously there's a hint in the name of the book yep absolutely i try i started reading a book from that era called how to win friends and influence people yes Dale Carnegie. absolutely and it's the classics superb. it's the classics that can be the most insightful so it's um good stuff i'll check that one out as well mick we've covered a lot but before we depart if I could just ask you our last question that we usually ask everybody on the show, which what, what's one thing that people wouldn't expect to know about Mick Sweeney? Which one, which one do I tell you? Which one do I divulge? <laughs> um, I, suppose, I suppose the fact that I'm a long-suffering Leeds United supporter, Pete. Okay. Um, from back when Leeds ruled the footballing world. 
Um, they're back in the Premiership now after 16 years in the wilderness. Um, and I'm hoping we can stay up. So, yeah, I'm a Leeds United fan through thick and thin and uh, through success and lack of success hung in there over the years. And um, we're back in the big time. So um, so that I, I, I leave you with that, Pete. That the, the, what you know what I got a little bit of history there. Robbie Keane played for Leeds United, didn't he? He did, he did, he did, he did. He drifted in, drifted out. He wouldn't have been seen as our one of our longer term stalwarts. Um, he wasn't there long enough, and I suppose at the time we weren't successful. And Robbie, in fairness, moved on to uh, greater and better things. When I was living in Bermuda back 20 years ago and just fell in with an Irish crowd and, you know, really got along quite well with them. And thankfully, my wife came out of that crowd, uh, which was which, which, you know, very <laughs> beneficial for me. But everyone was into the premiership and I just wasn't that much into it. And they're like, well, you got to pick a team, Pete. And well, Robbie Keane, I think, was playing for Leeds at the time. And also Live at Leeds is one of the most well-known albums uh, from the rock band The Who, who uh, whose guitarist is Pete Townsend. I wasn't named after him, but um, <laughs> I, I, you know, it comes up a lot. So I pick Leeds as the first team that I would support out of the premiership. Um, and then over time, and you won't like this, Mick, um, it became Liverpool because they wear red socks and my favorite baseball <laughs> team are the Red Sox from Boston. And now, <laughs> similarly, you know, coincidentally, the Fenway Sports Group now own Liverpool, but I'm not a big follower of it. But, you know, keep my eye on it from time to time. So that's, well, we, we, we'll take you back, Pete. If you, if you need to <laughs> come back to Leeds, we'll take you back. All is forgiven. Don't worry. You know what? I might, I might look deep, deeply into Leeds United in the same way I'm going to look deeply into Globotics upheaval and uh, also the fourth P of productivity. So, Mick, thank you so much. This was a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate you coming on the show um, and best of luck taking things forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pete. Thanks. That does it for this week, folks. And thanks to Mick for opening up his mind to help us figure out why he does what he does. Links and show notes for this episode are on moneyneversleeps.ie. So, check us out online. Also, you can subscribe to our Money Never Sleeps newsletter at moneyneversleeps.substack.com. If you're enjoying Money Never Sleeps and want to see it continue, make sure you hop on over to Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star review. And don't forget Conan Brophy from Create Sound. He mixes and edits each episode for us and is an excellent media man to get in touch with when you're thinking about launching your own podcast. As for me, I help startups get their products to market, get customers, and finance their vision. You can find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, or at norioventures.com. You can follow Owen Fitzgerald on Twitter at Owen Fitzgerald9. Finally, till next time, thanks for listening. See ya! Money never sleeps, pal.